In this video, we're going to look at the fallacy of circular argument, which is something different than begging the question. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, and we're going to do eight main things. We'll talk about what circular argument is. We'll look at the argument structure, which will be circular, of course. Uh, we'll talk about why it's a fallacy. We'll uh, examine some common situations in which you can expect to see it arise, and in which cases you want to be on your guard. Then we'll uh, take a look at three examples of the fallacy. Um, we'll go over some guidelines about how to spot it, what to be on guard for. For those of you who are students, we will talk about how not to mix this fallacy up with certain other fallacies with which it has some similarities. And then finally, we'll talk about how you as a critical thinker can avoid falling into this fallacy in your own reasoning, inquiry, argumentation, and life. So, what is a circular argument? Um, in some textbooks, I need to point out, this is brought under the heading of begging the question. Uh, here, I'm going to say that that's a little bit sloppy, that's a little less rigorous than we want to be, because they're not quite the same in terms of their structure. They do have a lot of similarities, but I, I think that we want to use a different name for this and just call it circular argument. Um, sometimes it's called Curculus and Probando, uh, Catch-22, when somebody talks about a Catch-22, quite often that can be an example of a circular argument, although sometimes it could also be a dilemma, and we want to talk about how those are different. Circular reasoning, or when somebody talks about a vicious circle, we're often dealing with this kind of fallacy. Now, what makes it a um, circular argument? At least one of the premises, not all the premises necessarily, but at least one of the premises that is being provided in order to support or justify the claim and the conclusion turns out in some way to be dependent on the conclusion itself. So you need the premises to establish a conclusion, but you need the conclusion in some way to establish at least one of the premises. Let's look at the structure of it now. So we, we begin with a premise that claim Y is true. And then that's going to lead us to, in some way, if claim Y is true, then claim X is true. However, what's being repressed in here is that claim Y is true precisely because claim X is true. There's the circularity. And that, you know, leading to the conclusion that claim X is true, it doesn't really follow unless you grant claim X in the first place, which is not what you're supposed to be doing since it's an argued for conclusion. Um, if we want to depict it graphically, it can be done very simply. You know, we're saying claim Y is true, and then if claim Y is true, claim X is true, and that should lead to claim X being true. But we see that, you know, you see the, the arrow showing that claim X is feeding back into claim Y, and that's part of what's supporting claim Y in the first place. So what's wrong with this? Well, it's pretty easy to see why this is not a good form of argumentation. The claim that's being argued for as a conclusion is being supported by premises which in turn require the conclusion to be true or accepted in order for those premises to be true or accepted, right? There's again that circularity. The, the structure is circular, providing no reason why you should accept the premises in the first place. So if you're not going to get somebody to accept the premises, they're not going to accept the conclusion. Um, I should actually talk about, you know, this as being an example of preaching to the choir would be another synonym that we could talk about. Arguments of this sort, I do want to point out, can sometimes have a complicated structure which conceals the fact that some of the premises are dependent upon the conclusion. So, you know, you can be taken in by it a little bit more easily when there's a lot of different premises at play. But all it takes is for one of the premises to be dependent in some way upon the conclusion in order for that premise to be acceptable or true in order for you to have a circular argument. Now, what are some common situations in which you might see this occurring? Um, like I put here, the fallacy occurs commonly when we're discussing matters that are controversial, where the person who's making the argument assumes 
an agreement on the audience's part to the premises that's actually lacking, sometimes on the basis of common sense, sometimes on you know, the basis of belonging to a presumed community of, of inquiry or interest or something along those lines. So it occurs in a wide variety of, of contexts. Some of these include personal relationships and conflicts. You know, you untangle um, arguments between, between spouses or boyfriends and girlfriends or, you know, friends or whatever. And you often will find circular argumentation being uh, smuggled in there. Um, marketing and advertising. Why should you buy this product? Well, because you want this and that leads to this and then that goes to this, right? You're constructing some premises. But then that turns out that the whole thing is dependent on you buying the product in the first place. Um, Politics and policy making. There's a lot of bootstrapping, as we call it, going on with argumentation in, in those arenas. Uh, economics, uh, education, religion. These are all areas where we can sometimes find circular reasoning going on, particularly when somebody's got a pet theory that they want to use to you know, lead to some sort of conclusion. But it turns out that the conclusion is actually required in order for all the premises to work, uh, that there's been some, you know, importation going on there. Um, medicine and psychotherapy, you know, diagnostics sometimes. Why did you diagnose things that way? Um, sometimes there can be circular reasoning involved in that. And in discussion of aesthetic matters, you know, when we're appealing to things like the beautiful, um, the aesthetically pleasing, the ugly, what makes it so? Well, sometimes it turns out that, it, you know, there's a circularity involved in those as well. Let's look at some interesting examples now. So this is one that I hope that you're not familiar with from experience, but unfortunately many of our younger people and also many of our older people out of work are running into this today. The conclusion is we can't hire you at this firm. Why? Well, in order to be hired at this firm, we'd need to see that you have extensive experience and training in the field. That doesn't sound that bad, right? However, the training and experience in our field would have to be acquired by you for working for several years at our firm. That's not possible because, you know, um, you would have to actually have been hired by the firm. So what they're saying is the reason we can't hire you is because we haven't hired you in the past, right? Um, well, that's what it actually comes down to in a way if you map it out. This is, in fact, a circular argument. Um, now, that's not going to do you any good when you go into the office and say, look, you're making a circular argument. Please give me a job. But it's nice to know at least that's what the, the condition is. Here's another classic one. You see this in a lot of logic textbooks. And, uh, you know, for religious believers, I am not actually saying here that the Bible can't be true or that God doesn't exist or God is, is you know, false or anything like that. Um, what I'm saying is this is a circular argument. This is not a good way to argue your case. Um, atheists, by the way, have their own sort of things like this. So here's, here's how the argument goes. We know that God exists and is entirely truthful in all matters upon which he communicates with human beings. The Bible is God's word provided to human beings. Therefore, the Bible is completely true in all respects. And it sounds good until you say, yeah, but wait a second. How do we know God exists or God is true? And then somebody says, well, look, it says here right in the book. And you're like, well, the book that you want me to say is completely true? And there is the problem. There is the circularity, right? Um, the Bible's true because in some way God was involved in the writing process. How do you know that God was involved in the writing process? Um, well, because it's inferred <clears throat> from something biblical. Anytime you're doing this sort of thing, you've got a circular argument. If you can bring in something from the outside, you could probably shore it up. Now, here's my favorite one. This is actually from the book Catch-22, from which we get the, the term Catch-22. This is the circular form. There's other ways to, to parse this out so it becomes something like a, a dilemma instead. But the circular form goes like this. The conclusion is, you are sane and you must fly the combat missions, which are dangerous, right? So here's the, the way the reasoning goes. You claim you're crazy and therefore should be grounded so that you don't fly any combat missions. But 
you would have to be crazy to be unconcerned about flying any more of these dangerous combat missions. But being concerned about your own safety in the face of dangers is a sign of possessing a rational mind. So a person possessing a rational mind is sane. So you must fly the combat missions that you don't want to fly, that are driving you crazy, that are scaring the hell out of you, right? And um, what's being assumed in the first place is you have to fly the combat missions. That's why you're having this, this fear response, which shows you to be sane, which means you have to fly the combat missions. It's, it's that chicken-egg thing over and over and over again, right? So how do you spot this now? Well, when you're considering an argument that somebody else is making, examine the premises to see whether they contain anything assumed to be true that is actually in some way being supplied by assuming the conclusion to be true. If that's the case, you have a circular argument, most likely. Be on guard, I think, is an important piece of advice when dealing with certain kinds of people or organizations. That, which ones? Those that have a relatively coherent, complex, but controversial perspective in whose arguments one is likely to encounter substantive assumptions being made. That's not to say that everybody like that is going to make a circular argument, but those are the cases where it's more likely to be made because there's big assumptions being made. And oftentimes those accounts you know, all the different parts are connected up with each other. So when somebody's trying to explain, well, why should we believe this? Circular argumentation can creep in there. Also, keep in mind there can be cases where both the premise, premises, sorry, and the conclusion are indeed true, but where the structure of the argument is circular. If the argument is a circular argument, you don't want to accept it as an argument. That doesn't mean that you can't accept the claims in the argument, but you should accept them for some other reason, right? There should be another basis for that. When you are um, a student who has to distinguish between this and other types of uh, fallacious arguments, what are the ones that you have to be on the lookout for? <clears throat> There's really just two. Sometimes it might be confused with the false dilemma fallacy, right? In the false dilemma fallacy, you're, you're actually saying, look, you, you don't want A and you don't want B, but there is no C. So, you know, you're kind of screwed. Or you're saying, well, you know, you don't want A uh, and there is no other alternative. So you have to have B. Um, it has a similar kind of structure in certain ways, but it actually has a different structure if you map it out. Why does this get mixed up with the circular argument? Well, think about the catch-22. In the catch-22, you really do have a circular structure to the argument, but it's being posed as if it is a dilemma. Look, either you're crazy or you're sane. If you're crazy, you're not going to care if you're flying. If you're sane, well, then you got to fly the mission anyway, right? Um, the other thing you want to watch out for, and again, you know, I don't want anyone to end up getting bad grades or something like that because they, they tangled with their instructor. If your instructor is actually telling you, no, circular argument is begging the question, okay, for the purposes of your class, go with your instructor because it's just a grade, right? And then after you get out of the class, say, well, that guy was wrong or that lady was wrong, and now I'm going to be more rigorous in my, my analysis of arguments. Begging the question is a little bit different than circular argumentation, but they are easy to mix up because um, in both cases, the premises and conclusions are, are connected up in weird ways. In one case, there's a circularity to it. In the other case, you're basically just repeating the same thing from premise to conclusion. One other thing I do want to say, not every case where there appears to be some sort of circularity involved in between the premises and conclusions is necessarily the circular argumentation fallacy. You got to show that there's a circular argument there. You got to show that unless this conclusion is granted, you're not going to get the premises um, holding or you don't have a circular argument. Now, how do you avoid falling into this fallacy yourself and, and inflicting it upon other people? Well, you know, one thing you can do is make sure when you are engaging in, in argumentation, trying to make a case, that the grounds that you're providing in the premises, the things that you're using to argue for the conclusion, are not actually assuming something that's built into the conclusion. So you're not smuggling the conclusion into the premises. 
you know, you will sometimes end up doing this, right? So if you do discover yourself engaged in, in circular argument, see if you can make it non-circular. See if you can improve the argument. See if you can provide some further grounds besides what's contained in the conclusion that you can use to support your premises. Then it's, it's not going to be a problem. Um, since we generally want to show conclusions to be true, because we already do think them to be true, you want to be on guard. You want to, you want to um, not make assumptions like that when you're trying to make a case to other people who don't necessarily share all of your assumptions already, or else you wouldn't make arguments, right? So be on guard against, against temptations to assume that your audience will grant you what the conclusion is providing you. You want to try to prove the conclusion independently of however you feel about it. That's part of being a good critical thinker. Last thing I need to say about this is this video is part of an entire series on the fallacies in a much larger channel devoted to logic, argumentation, and critical thinking. So if you enjoy this video, if you find it useful, if you think it's a valuable resource for other people, share it with them, uh, talk about it, try to apply this in your own life, and keep coming back to the channel because we're going to be constantly uploading new content, uh, and there's a lot of old content already accumulating in there, a lot of great stuff on the fallacies and, and many other topics in these areas.